Our fifth and final reader is an award-winning editor and founder of Other Voices Books, book, sorry, and author of the new collection, A Vacation on the Island of Ex-Boyfriends, which is available here for $15. Um, she has more copies available, $15. Published by Chicago's own Elephant Rock Books. Please give a warm Tuesday Funk welcome to Stacy Berline. part of this lineup. Um, I'm going to read from a story called Where It Starts. It takes you on a brief tour of Los Angeles. Um, I lived in Los Angeles for about 10 years, I lived, which means I actually lived in the shadows of Hollywood long enough that when Bill said Sarah used to work for the office of the president at first, I imagined her hanging out with Rob Lowe and Martin Sheen. Um, it was just like that. Exactly, that way was frustrating. Wonderful. Okay, where it starts. The ocean view room in Santa Monica had been her idea, but the relentless afternoon sun flooded their bed now, hot and unforgiving. He had thrown his clothes fast and fallen back onto the bed, trying to crack his back while she stood nearby, wiggling out of her skirt. Her quick to Elaine, who also had an older man, was that they would spend 25 minutes cracking his back for five minutes of sex but she didn't care. It's got a lot of old guy themes. But she, but she didn't care. Her pathetic reality was that she would have spent 25 days cracking just about anything for five seconds next to him. He raised an eyebrow as she climbed on top of him. You're still dressed, he said. She still had on the black bra and thong purchased for the occasion, although she knew he wouldn't really care. He wanted her naked. Still, she wouldn't forsake the ensemble. It was a runway bra, an it girl bra. He would have freaked if she told him that her La Perla bill might rival their bill for this hotel room. <laughs> Only for another moment, she assured him, leaning down to kiss him while reaching back to undo the hooks herself. He had never taken anything off her, expected a woman to do this part on her own. She kissed him the way she always kissed him, as if everything in her life led to this moment. The minute she was free of the excellent bra, he was on top of her, invigorated by her bareness and his newly cracked back. <laughs> he kissed her hard, and it went on like that, fighting for the top, both of them laughing through their kisses when they found themselves on bottom. This was a fantastic idea, he said. She wasn't sure if he meant the hotel, sex, reuniting, or all of it, but she wrapped her legs around his <laughs> and His condo was being heat-treated for termites. She had lent her house to a friend shooting a serial commercial. <laughs> if only temporarily, this was their place. He kept saying it like that. Our place. It has a nice ring to it, doesn't it, honey? Baby, he kept saying as she kissed his ears, his neck, the freckles on his shoulder, all the parts of him she had missed. He kissed her and touched her with some degree of urgency, refusing to slow down for even a second. He needed things to accelerate, never linger, and so they did. At some point, he lost track of the bed, and they landed together with a hard thud on the floor. They burst out laughing. If I were one of your 30-year-old boyfriends, he said, staring at the ceiling, we'd keep fucking right here on the floor, and I'm sure it would be hot, but I'm in my 50s, and I really need to get back into that bed. <laughs> <laughs> she stood up, let the 30-year-old boyfriend's comment slide, knowing it would annoy her when she recalled it later. There were no other boyfriends. From the moment she first heard his voice, there had been only him. Even in the time they were broken up, she had viewed every other man through the lens of him. Other men bored her. One year, three screenplays, and two houses later, she was back with him, renewed. They arranged themselves in the bed. She touched his chest while he pulled at the cool sheets. She wanted to say something about being in his arms again after all this time, but that wasn't right exactly. His hold on her had never been a tender one or simply physical. There was no denying that she loved him. She loved him and how she craved him. She was not as strong as she let her girlfriends believe. It turned out that obsession was more powerful than logic or even pride. This time, she would do anything to keep him. She'd been so taken by him from the beginning, lost in the days she spent intoxicated by the sound of his voice, that after the breakup, it had been difficult to work. A few weeks later, she managed to pick herself up to write as furiously as she ever had. There was a pathological quality to her drive then. She wrote scripts for films he might see or at least to read about in the trades. They were still in the same industry after all and longed for the time when they were in it together. 
If it wasn't a healthy approach, it was one that advanced her career. Her friends described her as heartbroken and functioning. She had no intention of going back to the heartbroken part. She pressed her body against his. I love you, he said. This time, she made herself believe him. LAX, we're going backwards in time. They stepped off the jetway into a nearby deserted gate area. The smell of the bright blue airport carpet always bothered her, the ammonia in the cleaner or something. She wrinkled her nose. The wrinkled nose was an appropriate end, she thought, to their three-day Seattle disaster. I'll find my own way home, she said, walking ahead of him. You cannot be serious, he said. She stopped, turned back to face him and said, it's over. I cannot be the one doing all the wanting. He stared at her. That's amazing, he said, and he wasn't being sarcastic. Did you just work that out, or have you been thinking that all day? Because it's an amazing line. It's beautiful, really. Kate Blanchett could deliver that line. Kate Winslet or Julia Ormond. The weekend didn't need to be rehashed. He had hardly cared whether she was with him in Seattle or not, and she wasn't willing to be put aside again. It's my line, and I'm serious, she said. Breathing deeply, she watched him realize his mistake. I know, I know, I know, he said, trying to return, shaking his head as if he could shake himself out of his brain. He stepped closer, grabbed her arm, took a deep breath. Honey, I'm so sorry you feel this way. She stared back. This was the best he could do, the only sort of apology she would ever receive from him. Not, I'm sorry I made you feel this way, only, I'm sorry you feel this way, an insistence that her feelings, not his actions, were the burden. <laughs> People from their plane hurried around them, wheeling carry-ons to the escalator. She had dropped everything at his invitation. One of his clients had a film premiering at the Seattle Film Festival. We'll go to the movie, he promised, and have the rest of the weekend to ourselves. She attended the movie alone, as he spent that night and the following two fighting on the phone with his ex-wife. Somehow the wounds from our divorce are still very raw for her, he had explained. I would appreciate it, she said, if those wounds could be described to your voicemail for a few hours. So that we might salvage our weekend. If the call goes to voicemail, she'll know that you're with me. Why shouldn't your ex-wife know that I am with you? She literally clenched her fists as she said this. Honey, please, she's crazy. Knowing that this is serious will make her crazier, and, well, that isn't fair to the kids. I don't want to be a problem for your kids, she whispered, but I want you. He hadn't responded then because his phone rang again. And now, in the middle of the airport, he looked at her like she was the crazy one. Let me make it clear, she said. This is goodbye, and I don't give a fuck which actress does it best on screen. <laughs> he didn't chase or fight her, and while she had not expected him to, she walked quickly, knowing the reality of it could crumble her at any minute. Even before she exited the baggage area and found a taxi, she felt awful without him. But she felt terrible with him, so either way, she was completely screwed. <laughs> West Hollywood. It was late afternoon in a bungalow he had rented for the month to be closer to the studio. She lifted the bedroom window open to feel a soft breeze, to smell the lavender in the yard, we host determined gardens always fighting the smog. They met for lunch at a nearby cafe and failed to eat a thing, this being their first time, anticipation trumping hunger. They lied atop the duvet now, shirts off, facing each other, and it beginning the essentially awkward maneuvering out of pants. He slowed down, hesitated to unbutton hers, mumbled something ridiculous about her clothes being too nice to mess up. She said, I would have never worn something you weren't welcome to rip off me. She got out of her pants herself, pushing them off the bed with her foot. She worked his belt buckle quickly, tugged at his belt, whipping it out of the loops and tossing it to the floor. Well, he said, actually rolling his eyes, you know, you could have just left the belt attached to the jeans. That was all very dramatic, he said, but inefficient, actually. He had a serious but practical look in his eye. He got on top of her then, but he wasn't playing. He looked seriously annoyed, in fact, that she had separated his jeans from the <laughs> She should have suggested it a more vibrant use for the belt at that moment, <laughs> to challenge his nerve or simply to make it all make sense, but she only wanted to get his jeans off and get on with it. It had taken 
them a ridiculously long time to get to this moment. With his business travel, the dozens of evenings devoted to his daughter's soccer and basketball games, and her trips to New York to care for her grandmother, it was beginning to seem like this relationship might never grow beyond phone calls. You're right, she said, because she knew nothing else to say, so bothered by his rightness. And it confused her, the inexplicable shift that occurred when the belt hit the floor, the way they were poised more for battle than tenderness. Mm -hmm. He seemed different now alone with her, older, suddenly judgmental. She touched his face, needing to impose the real moment quickly over the ones she had fantasized. It hadn't started like this, both of them nervous and annoyed, finally together in an ivory bedroom that would always look more like a set design than a true home. <laughs> he was still wearing his jeans when he went down on her. She finally got it then, that he was a man who needed to conquer a woman long before he loved her. Ventura. Sometimes there was no pretense of a professional question. There wasn't even a greeting. She picked up her phone and he said, baby, what are you wearing? She was curious, amused, intrigued, and she always played along. A little white camisole, she said, and a mini skirt that I'm wiggling out of right now. I have 10 minutes. The miniskirt was a little lie she allowed herself. Actually, she wore Lakers sweatpants, 10 years old and worn through at the knees. The camisole was real, but it was under a Miami Heat tank top. Too often, she wore rival teams. <laughs> Wiggling is good, he laughed. Wiggling is very, very good. So where are you, he said, trying to set the stage, the living room, the bedroom. The study, she said. She wasn't used to being the kind of woman whose house had a study. It started to sound to her like she lived on the goddamn clue board. <laughs> I'm Miss Scarlet, she thought, with the candlestick yeah. in the study. <laughs> she heard his breathing deepen. Are you going to sit on a chair, lie on your sofa? <laughs> Looking around her study, it occurred to her what she really, really wanted. You're going to fuck me against the bookcase, she said. You stand facing me. My shoulder blades are pressed into the bookcase, my legs wrapped around your waist. I want your hands grabbing onto my hips, my fingers clutching the shelves harder and harder as you're fucking me. His breathing came even deeper. Ten points for originality, he said. <laughs> she breathed deeper, too. Relieved. Today, she was the Hollywood person getting the 10 points she did not deserve. She was stealing from the last movie she rented, James McAvoy fucking Kiera Knightley in the library, with her head falling back onto the spines of Edith Wharton and Henry James. <laughs> His breathing mumbled and accelerated. He told her how he wanted her, how fantastic it was going to be in person, how he wanted to hear her come and needed to, how he wanted her to come hard and never hold back to give him everything she had. But it hadn't started here. Gripping the phone in the study of a new Ventura remodel, breathing in fresh pain as she worked her fingers in exactly the place she would later want his tongue, it hadn't started with atonement. He asked her, baby, are you wet? She said, not yet, so keep talking. <laughs> Sherman Oaks. There was only a moment when she was just the screenwriter and he was just her agent. A moment she failed to remember, the memory taken over by calls of the subsequent weeks when they had yet to meet but had talked incessantly about potential film projects. If they were both in town, they would spend days on their mobiles while tending to, the, to their respective tasks, his car to her car, his club to her gym, his juice bar to hers. It seemed that no one in Southern California kept an office anymore. Plus, the gridlock created by the construction closers on Los Angeles freeways that spring made coffee dates or quick meals together a near impossibility. You realize, he teased, if we lived in New York or London, we'd probably be married by now. He loved to hate Los Angeles and every aspect of Hollywood. They would be talking still, or he would be anyway, when they returned to their homes at night. You've made a good case for Beirut. That probably is the right place to set this film. I mean, what do we care? They'll shoot the whole fucking thing in Toronto anyway. If we get a young director, they'll want to do the gun scene in some Arabic pop nightclub, which will be obnoxious as hell, but we'll deal with it, and really fuck the social network. What about a film addressing the dangers of the internet fragmenting society? Yes, I meant fragmenting. The changing landscape of the Southeast? Promise me we'll get that into a, a film in some way that the cinematographers can't fuck up. I mean, have you seen what has happened to Phoenix? What the fuck? No, no, no. <laughs> you are not writing about Tibet again, my head will explode. Another affair with Buddhism, Jesus Christ, what more can Hollywood possibly say about the Dalai Lama? What do people even give a shit about these days? 9-11 doesn't sell anymore, which totally pisses me off, and that vampire and zombie shit is over, thank <laughs> fucking God. Diets, as if we didn't get enough calorie counting crap in the 80s, goddamn diets are everywhere, but that's hardly useful to us. No one is buying a film about the fucking zone, that's for sure. <laughs> 
They switched to landlines and phone sex whenever it occurred to him to worry about brain damage. <laughs> the way we are together is exciting, isn't it, baby? I like the way we're beginning, he said, his voice slower, relaxed now. When I have an idea, you are the very first person I want to talk to. We connect so easily. We focus so well. I promise you, I'll be a calming factor in your life. You know, someday, you will want to quit this house flipping obsession and move in with me. Listen, we both want the same things. We actually really make sense. She liked and feared that his mind was always ahead of hers. No negotiations, he and she all over the map, already a we. He was so sure of everything. His questions never really questions. Okay, baby, what are you wearing? I'll stop there. Thank you. Stacy Beerwright, everybody. A vacation on the island of ex-boyfriends. Get her book.